Okay, so thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to do another lay talk. I haven't done one for a while. So the challenge is uh, for me is to try and use as little jargon as possible. So I, I'm a NIHR research professor uh, since 2018 and a professor of cardiac imaging. And I'm based at the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences at the University of Leicester and the NIHR Leicester Biomedical uh, Research Centre. Uh, and I'm based at Glenfield Hospital. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I don't really have any real uh, conflicts of interest, but obviously the NIHR pay my wages and we get lots of support from the NIHR, both for the Biomedical Research Centre and our clinical research facility. And the work I'm talking about tonight in relation to uh, diabetes and heart failure has been funded by the NIHR, BHF, uh, in fact, there's, uh, and also we have uh, industry funding from AstraZeneca and previously Novo Nordisk and also the MRC. And I also have support from an imaging company called Circle CVI. And I just want to make it clear. So I am actually a cardiologist, a heart specialist with an interest in diabetes, and I'm not a diabetes doctor. So I'm coming to this from a different angle uh, than with a diabetes specialist. So what is heart failure? Well, as cardiologists, we describe heart failure as a syndrome uh, which is characterized by breathlessness, particularly uh, on exertion. And often it's associated uh, with fluid retention. And this ca can cause fluid to accumulate in the lungs and make people very, very breathless. And when that happens acutely, it's an incredibly distressing and dangerous condition. Other times the fluid can uh, accumulate from uh, back pressure on the right side of the heart, and this can cause lots of swollen ankles or indeed uh, fluid swelling in, in the abdomen. And really it's caused by an inability to pump, uh, that should be an inability rather than an ability to pump enough blood to the exercise muscles to meet the body's demands for oxygen. And it's an incredibly common condition almost 1% of the population has heart failure in the United Kingdom. And that's associated with huge cost. But not only is it associated with huge cost, it is one of the most malignant conditions we deal with. And by that, I mean, the outlook and the ch chances of dying is worse than for many cancers. And about 50% of people who have a clinical diagnosis of heart failure will actually die within five years and many will be uh, admitted to hospital on multiple occasions, and they have very poor quality of life due to this uh, restricting breathlessness. So just a reminder uh, for those that have done some physiology and uh, those who haven't, uh, the heart is of course the most important organ in the body. And if the heart stops beating, you die pretty quickly. So the heart really is a pump and it consists of four chambers. And then the middle here, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, but on the our left hand side or the right hand side of the body as we look at it, the veins bring blood with low oxygen back to the heart through the right atrium, the top chamber, goes into the right ventricle and that's pumped out through the pulmonary artery and it goes out to the lungs and it picks up oxygen and that brings uh, the pulmonary veins then bring back oxygen rich blood to the left side of the heart through the left atrium and the main pumping chamber, which is the left ventricle, which then pumps blood out the main artery, the aorta. And I'm going to talk about the aorta in a little bit more detail. And the aorta then goes off and branches and supplies blood to the brain and all the other major organs and um, the excising muscles in the body. And on the right hand side, is uh, it's actually an MRI picture. I'm going to show you lots of MRI tonight. And this is uh, what's called a 4D flow, where you can see that blood is flowing into the right side. And then uh, the left ventricle, when the blood comes back in here, it's pumping blood out at high velocity into the main aorta. And that's where you see the green uh, and sort of um, orangey bits going round uh, and supplies all the other organs. So when we have um, normal function, the heart, I'm going to just go back one. 
Okay, so the heart has to both pump and by pumping, the muscle contracts, and I think you'll all be familiar with that. So on the left-hand side of the screen are what we call long axis, and the top picture is a, a normal participant, and the heart is contracting normally. And each time the heart muscle moves into the middle, it's ejecting blood out through the aortic valve at the top here. And the image at the top in the middle is what we call a short axis view. And the bit that's highlighted the circle is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber. And it's a bit like a donut and it has lots of uh, muscle branches which attach to the valves. And on the right hand side, you can see an orange line. And this orange line is reflecting the pumping action whereby the heart muscle becomes smaller, shorter in fact, and you can see that comes down and it shortens by about 25%. And then there's a slight plateau. And then as it lengthens, this is the relaxation period. And this is really important for sucking blood into the main pumping chamber. And for the heart to pump, to work effectively, it has to pump well and it has to relax quickly to get enough blood in so that it can pump out about 70 mils per heartbeat uh, and five liters per minute for sort of average 70 kilogram man. And in the bottom uh, row, what you can see is a patient who has very severe heart failure where the heart is big, it is not uh, pumping very well at all, not thickening, and the contraction is a bit uh, uncoordinated. And you can see that the shortening here is only down to about 6% and the relaxation takes much, much longer. So this patient both has an inability to pump and what we call the systolic function and an inability to relax, which is the diastolic phase, the filling phase of the heart. And there are two common forms of heart failure. The commonest and well-known, or it used to be the commonest, it's about 50-50 now, is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that's when the pumping ability or function of the heart drops below 40%. So less than 40% of the blood in the left ventricle is pumped out into the circulation with each heartbeat. And then there is a more um, increasingly common condition called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this one is a little bit more difficult to understand. So the heart pumps normally or near normally, and the ejection fraction is more than 50%. So when you look at the pumping action, it's good, but the heart tends not to fill well. And this it tends to be associated with thicker heart muscle and poor relaxation. And actually people with diabetes are more prone to this type of heart failure. Now, what about diabetes and heart failure? I'm sure it cannot uh, have uh, alluded your attention that uh, there is a pandemic of type 2 diabetes. Now, I use this word, um, and particularly we're all aware what an infectious pandemic is with COVID, but a pandemic really means that a disease is very common and uh, affects all the different areas of the world. And diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, and this is distinct from diabetes, which people uh, have a strong genetic condition uh, where there is a loss of insulin production. Type two diabetes causes high blood sugars, but the pancreas produce insulin normally, but the tissues are resistant to the effects of the insulin. And this is really strongly associated with obesity and physical inactivity. And there's approximately 400 million people in the world with uh, diabetes, and this is increasing exponentially. And if you see down the bottom right hand side, it's projected that there'll be about 80 million people in India and 40 million people in China uh, by 2030 who will have diabetes. Now, the important thing in relation to type 2 diabetes and heart failure it's very well known that patients are at increased risk of heart attacks and strokes with diabetes. And I've shown this graph on the left hand side is reflecting the incidence, increased incidence of heart attacks. And on the right is the increased incidence of heart failure. Now, these dots 
uh, colored dots to the right of the dashed line, the further they are to the right, and if you look down at the bottom of the scale, it's up to nine times, this tells you how much more likely than someone without diabetes the risk of developing heart failure is. So one of the, the good news is if you are uh, greater than 80 years of age when you develop diabetes, you're actually not at significantly higher risk of developing heart failure. But if you're less than 55 years of age, <clears throat> then you're almost two and a half times more likely to develop heart failure. And that is true. And if you de develop other risk factors for heart disease, such as poor blood sugar control, smoking, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, then the risk is increased. And this is particularly true in younger people with diabetes. And that's important. <clears throat> so this is a recent paper that's just been published, which actually estimates from the Danish population that the lifetime risk of developing heart failure for an individual with diabetes in both men and women is around 25%. Now, there is some good news within this because that is a very high risk. And the purplish dots indicate that the risk is slightly lower since 2005 than it was in 1995. And that may be due to more effective treatments. And it's not all doom and gloom, uh, but I want to show you some data from the UK first. And as I mentioned, that heart attacks and strokes are well known to occur in people with diabetes. But these data from the National Diabetes Audit in 2015-16 actually show that there were more people admitted to hospital, more than double admitted to hospital with heart failure and diabetes than there were combined for heart attacks and strokes. And over one third of all people admitted to hospital with, that, with heart failure had diabetes. And the audit concluded that heart failure is emerged as the most common and deadly vascular complication of diabetes. So on to the good news. Well, the good news is we now have a class of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors, which actually lower blood sugar. And these drugs have been shown for the first time to reduce the risk of developing heart failure. So the y-axis here has the percentage of patients admitted with heart failure. And on the bottom is the time after treatment. And you can see that very early on, the red curve with this drug called empagliflozin separates from the gray curve, which was the dummy tablet. And this chance of developing heart failure was reduced by about a third. And importantly, this was in patients um, with high risk of cardiovascular disease, but two subsequent trials have also shown this class of drugs has similar effect at reducing heart failure. So as an imaging specialist, what do I do? Well, an analogy I like to um, give to people when I'm talking about imaging and heart is to think about your house and all the things that uh, are in the house to keep it functioning well. So you have a boiler, which is pretty similar to the heart, and it's the main pump, and it gets all the warm uh, water around your house. You have electrics and you have plumbing, and the heart is very similar to that. So if you think about the heart mainly being as a pump, we also have arteries, which is like our plumbing, and we have people who go in and remove blockages. And we have electricians who deal with problems, such as if your heart slows down, you can get a pacemaker. And when the heart is pretty sick and it's badly damaged, then we also have cardiac surgeons who might go in and replace a valve or put bypass grafts on. Now, my job as an imaging specialist is to investigate patients who have suspected symptoms related to heart disease and to uh, guide their clinician or supervising doctor as to whether the person's heart is completely normal, whether they have mild disease that may be managed just with tablets, 
whether they have very severe disease, such as narrowing in the arteries, and they may benefit from stents or bypass surgery. And a very important thing that I do is to stop people having unnecessary investigations. So sometimes we might say, look, your, heart, your house or heart is structurally fine. You don't need to do anything about it. We might say you need a lick of pain, which would be the equivalent to taking some tablets. So my role as an imager is a bit like a quantitative surveyor or indeed um, a structural engineer. So what are our aims in terms of our research programme in relation to diabetes and heart failure? Well, the first thing is we want to define how common early heart failure is in people with type 2 diabetes. And the reason we want to target early heart failure is because of what I've already told you, that actually, even when you're diagnosed with heart failure, although there are some effective treatments, the outlook is really bad. And what we want to do is try and identify people earlier in the disease process so that the, the, the heart failure and the conditions uh, causing it may be reversible. And we want to take that uh, account for differences in age, and there are differences in heart function between men and women. And also there may well be differences, particularly in heart size, between uh, patients from minority ethnic groups compared to white people, and particularly, particularly thinking here about South Asians, which, is, which you know is extremely common ethnicity within the Leicestershire area. And the idea by using our imaging techniques is that we'll try to better understand the causes of early heart failure and type two diabetes. And that may allow us to then target the conditions which are most likely to cause heart damage. And thirdly, once we've done that, we want to go on and assess whether interventions such as with drugs or repurposing drugs or other lifestyle interventions can actually reverse this heart, early heart failure and reduce the long-term risk, get people down from that 25% risk of lifetime risk of developing heart failure back to something closer to the population risk of 10%. And that's our aims. So most of what we do when we're using these imaging techniques involves MRI scanning, not completely. And in Leicester, we're very, very fortunate. We had an uh, NIHR research scanner for, for 10 years. And in the last year, we've just uh, received funding uh, from the British Heart Foundation, along with the trust, and we've put in a brand new research scanner in our BHF uh, Leicester MRI research facility. And this is a picture of me. Uh, they're opening uh, the facility with some visitors from the BHF. And here is one of our PhD students going into the scanner with our radiographer, Kelly. And you can see that the MRI scanner itself is quite a big machine and it has a relatively narrow tunnel. And we also have an exercise machine that allows us to look at function of the heart under stress. Now, because it's quite a small tunnel, if you're very claustrophobic, it's possible you may not get into the scanner in the first place. Although we do tend to um, reassure patients, we can put a little mirror over their head and we can offer them sedation. And less than 5% of uh, people find, uh, are unable to, to get into the scanner. And that's very important. Now, how does MRI work? So th this is some very basic physics and uh, most of you will know that your body's made up of lots and lots of molecules and there are billions and billions of uh, hydrogen or uh, atoms or protons. And interestingly, they have a positive charge. And when you put them, they're normally spinning around in all sorts of directions. But when you put them into a magnet, they align along the direction of the magnetic field. But for every one million protons, about one will point uh, in the lower energy state. And that allows you to be able to detect uh, a very small uh, magnetic charge when you knock the proton off its spinning axis with a radio frequency pulse. And using some very, very uh, fancy physics and mathematical reconstruction, you can work out where the signal is coming from and how much water is in each element of the tissue. And that gives you these lovely pictures of the heart. And we can see right into the body. And when we do heart MRI scans, we can exploit the different properties of the MRI scanner to look at the structure and function of the heart, 
It's very, very good for visualizing the amount of fat in the body. We also can do what's called tissue characterization, uh, looking at the different water and fat contents in different tissues. We're going to look at the blood supply. I'm going to look at that in more detail. We do complete coverage of the heart in great detail, looking um, usually every centimeter. And we can look at the valves. And MRI is the gold standard technique also for assessing whether there's any heart muscle scarring, such as a heart attack. And we can do all of this depending on uh, how much information you want, but we can do all of this in about 45 to 60 minutes. And most patients find it reasonably tolerable. So what are the advantage of it, advantages of MRI? Well, first of all, there's no dangerous radiation. And that's really important because X-ray uh, and CT scans use ionizing radiation and that's associated with a very small increased risk of cancer. So we don't have that with MRI and it means you can bring the patient back. We can see deep inside the body and it doesn't matter if you get lung disease or if you're overweight or obese for that matter. As I've mentioned, we can uh, tissue, uh, we can understand the makeup of the tissues, including the heart muscle. It has excellent spatial resolution and very good temporal resolution. So we can look at the heart as it pumps and relaxes. And generally, we get really, really good image quality, which increases the, our diagnostic confidence in the information that we get. Now, I've said essentially it's very, very safe, but is there any side effects of MRI? So this is a picture of uh, when I went to uh, Amsterdam in 2004 to study heart MRI scanning. And I was looking at this picture after the event and I thought, isn't it a bit odd? Look at all the men, especially those near the front, and they're all going bald. And that is me uh, uh, when I was about 35 and I was just starting out in my MRI training. And this was me a few years ago. And my supervisor, Bert van Rossum in Amsterdam, he started really young but not as young as Chris Kramer from Virginia. So I do wonder particularly whether MRI actually um, causes your hair to fall out, particularly if you're a man. And as I'm not in the audience, I just want to uh, make it clear that is a joke. So now for the last part of the um, talk, I'm going to tell you about what we've been doing in heart imaging studies and type 2 diabetes in Leicester. So the biggest one that we have running uh, started with a BHF grant is now uh, the subject of my NIHR research professorship. And I devised this in conjunction with Dr. Gurav Gulson, who's actually in the audience, and he made up this slide. So what we wanted to do in the PREDICT study is look at the prevalence, that's how common it is, and the determinants of early heart failure in people with type 2 diabetes. And we wanted the people we recruited to be reflective of the local population and have a proper ethnic mix. I have to say, not many of the people in our study are as slim as the, as the people in our cartoon here. And when they come to visit, they have blood tests to look at markers which may indicate heart muscle damage or other markers of inflammation. They have an ultrasound scan, a CT and an MRI scan. We do an X exercise test with uh, and measure how fit they are and how much oxygen they're able to supply to the exercise and muscles. We monitor their blood pressure for 24 hours and we also put a little accelerometer on like many of you will actually have uh, on your watches but this one's a bit more detailed and really gives us very uh, detailed assessments of someone's physical activity. And the whole visit from start to finish lasts about four to five hours. And then we show uh, the participants all their pictures and tell them how healthy their heart is and what they may need to do to reduce the risk of developing heart failure in the future. Now, we've recruited well over 200 participants now. And we, as I mentioned, we use multimodality imaging. So the top picture is an ultrasound scan, the black and white one. The bottom left is a CT scan. And this patient actually has very heavy 
calcification, which is like chalky furring up of the arteries, which is uh, essentially coronary artery disease, an MRI scan in the top right, and then we look at the blood supply, and the graph on the bottom is uh, the measurements of both the oxygen and carbon dioxide that we obtain during the exercise test. And then uh, this uh, does look a bit like Dr. Gilson, and he would look at all of these and work out and tell the patient which uh, aspects of the heart was abnormal, look at the blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, think about their exercise, uh, physical activity, and, and uh, advise both the patient and uh, their general practitioner how they may improve their heart health. So what do we find when we look at the heart size and function in patients with diabetes? So many of you, many of you will have heard about the UK Biobank study. In fact, it was in the news today telling us that we should all go to bed between 10 and 11 o'clock at night to reduce our chances of dying or having a heart attack or stroke. And over 500,000 people have taken part in this study who were aged between 40 and 69. And in 300, um, sorry, in this uh, study looking at the MRI scans of 3,900 patients uh, or volunteers, 143 of whom had diabetes, what it showed was that all of the chambers in the heart, the left and the right ventricle and atrium are smaller than non-diabetic people. The heart weight is very similar. But when you look at the thickness of the heart in relation to the heart volume, the heart muscle in the people with diabetes is actually thicker, although the pumping function looks normal, but there are subtle abnormalities of the function um, when you look at strain, and that's the percentage shortening in the heart. And that has been confirmed in other studies. And this is uh, on an MRI scan, uh, a patient on the left-hand side who has type 2 diabetes compared to a, patient, uh, a healthy uh, volunteer on the right. They aren't exactly to scale, but what I hope you can see on the images on the left-hand side without the red, uh, green and red contours is that the heart uh, volume, which is the white bit in the middle of the heart muscle, is quite small and the heart muscle is quite thickened here. And that's fairly typical. And that's what we call concentric remodeling when the heart muscle is thicker all round. Now, in one of our first studies in uh, patients with diabetes, we actually looked at very young adults with type 2 diabetes, which the diabetes doctors are increasingly seeing, particularly because of the growth in obesity. And what we did was we looked at uh, adults less than 40 years of age, and we studied 20 people with type 2 diabetes, and their average age was just under 32. And we compared them to 10 obese, non-diabetic controls, and 10 healthy, normal weight, lean, non-diabetic controls. And they were similar age, um, similar sex, but what we saw was, if you look at this mass over volume, which is this is how much how thick your heart is, both the obese people and the diabetes uh, patients had about a 10% increase in the heart thickness relative to the heart volume. And what we also saw was a reduction in this diastolic strain rate. This is the relaxation of the heart, where it was reduced quite markedly in diabetes down to 1.5 compared to 1. almost 2 in the healthy controls. And in the obese people, it wasn't quite as, quite as bad. So even though these people were young and had a relatively short duration of diabetes, they already had clear abnormalities of their heart structure and function. We then went on to look at how stiff the main artery in the body is. And I mentioned that the aorta has to accommodate the 70 mils of blood every time it's ejected from the heart. So when the heart, when the heart pumps, the aorta expands and accepts that blood as it's ejected. And then it acts like a capacitant vessel and slowly contracts. And that helps uh, push blood round to all the organs and it dampens the effect of blood pressure. So when the heart, when the aorta becomes stiff, you get much higher 
uh, pulse waves with higher pressure. And what we demonstrated, it was well known that people with diabetes tend to have stiffer arteries. And what we demonstrated was that this stiffness in the artery was directly related to increased heart muscle thickening. So AD down the bottom is how much the aorta actually can expand. So the higher that is, the better. But what we found is the people with stiffer uh, aortas on the left had thicker hearts, and that was independent of blood pressure. So this may be a target to try and improve the heart function in people with diabetes before heart failure develops. Now, we also actually looked at people who had heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. That's when the heart pumps normally, but tends to be thicker and stiff. And we compared 75 people with this condition who also had type 2 diabetes and 65 who didn't have diabetes. And what we found was the heart volumes were a little bit lower, particularly the top chamber, the atria. But again, the heart muscle was thicker. And again, it was about 20% thicker in those with diabetes than those without. And interestingly, although the people with diabetes and without diabetes had the same risk of dying, the blue and red curves uh, overlapping, this increased thickening of the muscle was associated with an increased risk of either dying or being readmitted to hospital with heart failure. Now, as we've mentioned before, people with diabetes are at increased risk of developing coronary artery disease, and that's narrowings in our arteries, but they also get abnormalities, probably directly due to the high sugar content and inflammation of the very small blood vessels, which control the blood supply into any organ. And you're probably familiar that people with diabetes are at increased risk of get going blind and increased risk of developing kidney failure. And both of these are due to small vessel disease or what we call microvascular disease. Now, this small vessel disease also can affect the heart. Now, MRI is an excellent technique for looking at the blood supply to the heart. And I have done many studies investigating patients with chest pain and to see whether we can see abnormalities. Now this uh, image shows uh, the bright signal coming in now to the right, then to the left, and then the heart muscle goes a grayish white, but at the top of the picture and around the right-hand side and onto the bottom of the heart muscle, it remains very, very dark, almost black. And this tells us that this patient has very severe narrowings in the heart arteries in a regional distribution. Now, using some very clever physics, we now get fully automated and quantified uh, blood supply to the heart muscle, myocardial blood flow, within minutes of undertaking this test. And basically it uses the concentration of the dye going into the, the heart and then uh, uses a calculation based on how much of the dye moves into the tissues. And within two minutes gives us these color coded maps where yellow is about five milliliters per gram per minute. In this particular example, the blue images at the bottom are the blood supply at rest. And the top uh, line is in response to a stimulant drug. And you can see that most of the heart increases the blood supply quite dramatically, but at the bottom of the heart, it stays blue. And this is consistent with a severe narrowing in the heart artery. Now in people with diabetes, this is an example on the left where a uh, sort of expert observer like myself can see that the outer part of the muscle goes quite bright gray, but the inner bit of the muscle is stays somewhat dark gray, it doesn't fully get as much contrast. And when we look at this, this is during a stress examination, the color map stays blue. And this patient's maximal blood flow was only 1.2 mils per gram per minute, and at rest it was 0.7. So this patient could only increase their blood supply to their heart by a factor of 1.6 or one and a half times. And when you exercise, you must increase the blood supply to the heart because it's doing more work. 
And this is a, a potential uh, reason why people will get symptoms and won't be able to exercise. And this is another diabetic patient from also from the PREDICT study, who you can see the blood supply is orange and yellow, and their stress blood flow was 2.6, and the resting blood flow was just 0.5. So they were able to increase the blood flow by 500%. And in another study with Dr. Goulson, we looked at whether this ability to increase the blood supply to the heart is important. And what we demonstrated was that there was a linear relationship between the ability to uh, increase the blood supply to the heart myocardial perfusion reserve and the ability to exercise and extract oxygen on the exercise test. And when we put in all the other factors that we think limit exercise capacity, including age, sex, potentially ethnicity, smoking, blood pressure, this myocardial perfusion reserve came out as an independent association with exercise capacity. I did this echocardiographic measure, which is an estimate of the, the relaxation function of the heart. So both of these appear to be important. Now, we went on in an even bigger cohort and looked at how all these factors on the left, age, sex, ethnicity, smoking, diabetes duration, and number of glucose lowering tablets, blood pressure, body mass index, and blood sugar control, how they affected different components of heart function, both the heart thickening, the heart pumping, the stiffness of the main artery and the blood supply to the heart. And what was interesting is that the systolic blood pressure was associated uh, adversely with the first three. And interestingly, we've now looked at this in an even bigger cohort, and it now sh shows that it's actually associated with reduced blood supply as well. And despite other studies suggesting that the sugar control is important, we found no association between sugar control so this suggests that what we need to do is make sure people with diabetes have really good blood pressure control to reduce the additive damage to the heart muscle and the blood supply. Now, for the last uh, five minutes or so, I want to tell you about some trials that we have done and are continuing to do, mainly focused on lifestyle interventions on, uh, in people with diabetes. Now, the first thing to say is, and most of you will be aware of this, that it is very clear that type 2 diabetes, which when I was at uh, medical school, was taught that it would be a condition that would steadily worsen associated with older age. But we know now that if you either lose lots of weight, such as through bariatric surgery or diets, and in this example, the direct study using a meal replacement plan, whereby 24% of the patients in the meal, low calorie meal replacement plan, put their diabetes into remission. And 46% of them, um, that persisted out to 12 months. And what was interesting was that if you look at those that lost dramatic amounts of weight in the bottom, if you lost 10 to 15 kilograms, 57% went into diabetes remission and 86% if you lost more than 15 kilograms. So we undertook the diastolic study in younger adults with type two diabetes less than 60 years of age, and we compared them to controls at baseline. And then we randomized the people with diabetes to one of three arms, routine care, exercise training, or the low calorie diet uh, made up of shakes and um, things like that, and uh, prepackaged uh, meals. 810 calories a day for 12 weeks until they lost 50% of their excess body weight. We randomized 89 people. And what we found at the end of it was blood pressure was slightly reduced in the routine care, mainly because we uh, increased their medication. There was no real change in it, uh, weight or blood sugar control with exercise or indeed blood pressure but exercise capacity improved and people got fitter. And in the meal replacement plan, the average weight loss was 13 kilograms. 80% of people had remission of diabetes and they had dramatic reductions in their blood pressure. And when we looked at the heart muscle improvements and function, the routine care group uh, didn't see any change. 
there was an improvement in the stiffness of the heart with exercise, but we didn't see the stiffness improve with the diet. However, we saw that the heart muscle thickness reduced and there was really a very dramatic effect on how stiff the main blood vessel was. So we take it from this study that exercise and weight loss have different and potentially complementary effects on both the heart structure and function. So that brings us on to the RESET trial. And this has been led by my colleague in the, the Leicester Diabetes Centre, Professor Tom Yates. And it's funded by the Medical Research Council. And it's a two country study between the UK and Canada. And what we're focusing on is the people at highest risk. So these are the young people less than 40 years of age, and they're going to be randomized. In fact, we're just trying to randomize the first patients now to either standard care or a combination of the meal replacement plan and exercise training. And then we will reassess both their fitness, the effects on their body composition and their heart structure and function at 24 weeks. And then this trial uh, is funded by one of the major drug companies, AstraZeneca. And this is now using a combination of one of the drugs which we know is effective at reducing the risk of heart failure. And in fact, is a good treatment for patients with heart failure, dapagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor. And what we're now doing is looking at dapagliflozin alone versus dapagliflozin plus supervised exercise training and this time, instead of just standard care, patients in the other control arm will be aiming to lose the same amount of weight as those in the dapagliflozin arm. And that will help tell us whether the effect of the SGLT2, the dapagliflozin, is more than just the benefit of uh, losing weight and a small reduction in blood pressure. And we've now randomized about 10 of 145 participants in this trial. So, in conclusion, I want to uh, emphasize that type 2 diabetes is associated, associated with an excess risk of uh, developing heart failure. And this is generally linked to people having smaller, stiffer hearts. There are new drug therapies which reduce this risk of heart failure. And I've also shown you data that lifestyle interventions can put diabetes in remission and is associated with improved heart and blood vessel function. So we're trying to identify the causes of heart failure in people with type 2 diabetes using these advanced imaging techniques. And we're currently undertaking trials using combination of lifestyle interventions and or drugs to see if we can improve or reverse this early heart failure so that we may reduce the risk of uh, patients developing heart failure in the future. And there are many other studies either planned or underway, and obviously not just in Leicester. So um, all of this work can't be done without many, many people. As I mentioned already, Gaurav Gulson's done a huge amount of it. I've got a big team working with me, both uh, in um, the imaging and the radiographers and nurses, physiologists. We've had multiple students working on the study, and we work very, very collaboratively with the Life Leicester, uh, Leicester Diabetes Centre and the lifestyle theme of the BRC, and particularly want to thank all of the participants with diabetes have taken part in a research of which there are several hundred. And uh, I can't do all of this work without uh, the funding and our major funders are the NIHR, uh, the British Heart Foundation and the Medical Research Council. Thank you. And I think we have 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jerry. That was um, really, really interesting. Um, we have had a few fair few questions um, come into the chat, so we'll go through a few of those now. We'll get to um, as many of those as we can and then wrap up by half past six. I'm just trying um, to get rid of my halo. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very angelic. <laughs> um, the first one, so that I think on one of your earlier slides you'd uh, mentioned swollen feet. So are swollen feet a sign of heart failure? It can be, but there are many other reasons uh, for developing uh, swollen feet. It's quite common 
Um, and most people with swollen feet will not have heart failure. There's one or two other little clues that if you press it, if, the, if you leave dents, if you press the swollen feet, that does tell you that there is, um, there's quite a bit of excess fluid, but it doesn't, it's not specific for heart failure. Some drugs can do it. And there's other things like um, what we call lymphedema, although that tends not to cause pitting. So it can be, but not always. Okay. Um, is there a way to check if your heart is pumping blood out at less than 40% without going to the doctors? No. Um, so um, this is an interesting one. So the, obviously you can have damage to the heart muscle and have no symptoms. And actually in um, heart failure patients, how well the heart pumps isn't terribly well associated with how symptomatic someone is. So you can have an ejection fraction less than 10% and have near normal exercise capacity. Uh, and on the other hand, you can have this heart failure preserved ejection fraction and be severely symptomatic, breathless on minimal exertion. So if uh, general practitioners are seeing people who have symptoms consistent uh, with heart failure, for example, exertional breathlessness, they will often do uh, some tests to listen to the heart, which may or may not uh, identify a problem, but they'll tend to do an ECG. If your ECG is completely normal, it's very unlikely you have heart failure. And then there's a common blood test called BNP for short. And if that's high, if that's low, you have a very low chance of having heart failure. And I'm just going to put one caveat in Unfortunately, BNP goes down if you're overweight or obese. Um, so we have to use lower thresholds. But if your initial tests are suspicious, then usually you'll be sent for an ultrasound scan. But nothing that people can do at home if you're concerned, go and consult your GP. Definitely, yeah. Um, this might be a bit outside of your remit as you're not a diabetes specialist, but why is the Asian population more prone to having diabetes? Yes, that, that's a, a great uh, question. So um, there's type 2 diabetes has got a strong genetic association. Um, and so if, you're a, if you get diabetes and you're an identical twin, your twin is about 90% more likely to develop diabetes as well. So there are definitely genetic causes. Um, over and above that, um, we now believe, and I have a slide which I haven't shown, but people uh, from Asian ethnicity, and particularly South Asians, develop diabetes at a, a much lower uh, body mass index than, than white people. So their normal weight probably means that they should be lower than what we have. And there is a suggestion that they have, they may have excess fat, particularly around the organs. And that's one of the things I haven't shown the data today that we're interested in. Uh, I, but I don't think it's fully understood. Um, what is very clear is in India and in China, when uh, people who have lived on, let's say, a fairly typical rural healthy diet move into cities and develop uh, a westernized type of lifestyle with reduced physical activity, um, increased calorie intake, put on weight, they're very likely to develop diabetes. Thank you. Um, I think this might relate to one of us specific slide. Why would it be that 80 year olds are less at risk of type two related heart failure than people aged 50 and below? Yes, so that, that's an excellent question. So I think the first thing is, as you get older, your risk of uh, developing heart failure is generally higher. Um, and what we think it is, is that some of these abnormalities related to the diabetes and the damage they cause to the heart and blood vessel accumulate over time. So it may take several years of having the diabetes before you see it reversible effects and the older you get and with what we call competing risk because people die of other conditions cancer um, strokes etc that may partly explain it I think we don't fully know 
Um, you touched on this a little bit as well, but if a, if a patient is able to reverse their diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and has previously been told they had heart failure, what is the capacity of the heart function to improve? Excellent question. So I, I'm going to give uh, one of our studies a little plug. So some of the work that we've done previously in relation to the remission of the diabetes, when I presented this to uh, patient groups, um, they said, what about people who spontaneously go into remission through, not through a low calorie diet, bariatric surgery, but have just changed their diet, done more exercise and lost weight. And we're actually looking for people now to take part in PREDICT who've gone into remission. And what we want to see, what we're going to do if we get enough of them, we've got about seven or eight at the minute. And if we can get to about 20, what we'll do is we'll match them to people of the same age, ethnicity and sex, who would have had the same duration of diabetes and then we'll be able to compare how thick their hearts are, how well they contract, what the blood supply is like. And that will give us, it won't be proof, but it will give us a very good idea of how much of these changes are reversible. Um, or at least how you slow the progression. So we, we're, we, we're, if you're out there and your diabetes is in remission, please contact me and my team. We're looking for you. You get, and, and what we say is, come and get a free heart MOT. <laughs> it's something in it for you as well. That moves us very nicely onto the next question, which was actually, are you still recruiting participants for the PREDICT study? We are. And uh, so we need, um, we've got lots of people lined up. We're virtually, I mean, this study is incredibly popular. I, we're at about 220 at the minute. We actually need to get 500. We've got about another 40 lined up but we need 500. So we're only about halfway. So yes, uh, you can either contact or send through your details. Uh, if you don't mind, I will pass them on to the fellow who's Jan Yeo, who's mainly recruiting. And we have another fellow uh, called Abhishek Datani who's doing it. I, and I didn't show it today, but we have these other trials. So if you come in to predict, we then potentially can offer you to go into interventions and we have another study which is looking at a different type of contrast, which actually tells us how the heart uses calcium. And this is very, very exciting for us because calcium is incredibly important. And um, there's just ourselves in Edinburgh doing these studies at the minute. And we've already recruited 20 participants into that study. Fantastic. And if anybody um, wants to send an email through to the NCSEM as well, we will forward those on. And put people on. Perfect. Um, could you say that the thickness of someone's heart may tell us their chances of suffering with type 2 diabetes? Oh, oh, that's a great question. Um, at the minute, no. So that there are many things that influence the thickness of the heart. Um, some of it will be your body size, uh, how heavy you are. Probably the biggest determinant is going to be your blood pressure and types of exercise can influence the heart muscle as well. So it's a, it's slightly complex and there are genetic traits for how thick your heart muscle is as well, but it's something that would go in the mix. And what, one of the things that I think it is common is what we really see when I'm looking at all these people who come through and I report all the MRI scans and the, the reports go to their doctors, the volumes really are consistently small. So the heart muscle is a little bit thicker, but it's a combination of the heart muscle being thicker and the volume of the heart being low that puts this relative thickness up. And that is the, that really is the, the, as much as anything. So if I see that, I ask the question, you know, as a patient diabetic, and then you've got the additive uh, effects of high blood pressure. Um. How are heart failure rates or imaging findings different between type 1 and type 2? Oh, really good question. So interestingly, we, we now have a new uh, professor of uh, type 1 diabetes, and we want to start looking at this very question. They have been much less well studied in the literature, um, and I think it's a gap because the focus has tended to be on heart attacks and strokes with the type ones. So it's something we really want to look at and there's 
scanty literature out there. So that's on our, that's on our to-do list. On the radar. <laughs> yeah. And just, I didn't say it again, but about, of all the people with diabetes, about 90% of type 2 and 10% type 1. And the proportion with type 2 is increasing. Um, normally, when a muscle is concentric, it's expanding, making it bigger. And when it contracts, it's more power-based. Isn't it a good thing that the heart isn't being concentric, but being eccentric contracting? So the, the heart tends not to do eccentric contraction because when it's uh, relaxing, it's not under pressure. It's a passive untwisting. Um, it's, it's still energy dependent, but unlike if you're walking downstairs or walking down uh, a mountainside, when your, mus your muscle then is having to generate huge amounts of force to decelerate your body, the heart isn't actually doing that. So the concentric contractions, it's normal and it's lengthening as it's relaxation, which is not under loaded conditions, if that makes sense. That's Thank God I've got a physiology degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, is 850 calories a day quite dangerous? And what kind of activities were your participants doing? And would, would there be any... Um, effects of continuing that type of diet in a longer term? Okay, so um, so the, the diets have been shown to be extremely safe. We had no serious adverse uh, events uh, in the diastolic study. It's obviously been done in primary care, very similar, and we had 810 calories a day. The patients were monitored with a dietitian, um, and we stopped all of their blood pressure lowering and all of their uh, blood sugar lowering therapy because um, obviously calorie intake's gone down. Uh, and what happens, and I haven't shown it, is blood pressure, the weight, and the sugar control improve dramatically. And the people who stick to the diet get a little bit euphoric. They really like it. Um, in fact, I might try it. <laughs> uh, so... Obviously, if, if you get down to normal weight and then stay with a calorie intake that's less than half of what you need, then you can you you, you could dangerously start to lose uh, muscle. Uh, the diet is supplemented with essential vitamins, though, so you don't really uh, have a risk of becoming vitamin D or B deficient. In fact. Okay. Um I think we're going to move on to the last question and then we'll probably wrap it up for this evening. So the last one is, do you think it's feasible for CMRI to become the standard first line test for chest pain slash cardiac symptoms instead of CTA and echo? Will the technology become inexpensive enough in the near future? OK, that is another talk. Uh I, so I'll declare my, contra, uh, my conflict. I am an MRI enthusiast, uh, zealot. Uh, CT is brilliant at low risk people who have got a low risk of heart disease. Myself and my colleague through his NIH, our clinician scientists, are doing a head to head comparison of the latest fanciest MRI techniques that I showed you versus CT with FFR in people at high risk and of heart disease. And I think MRI will win, but I don't want to prejudge. We've recruited about 50 of 300 participants. Well, if you want to come back for another talk, you are more than welcome. We would love to have you. Delighted. Well, and I need to take my daughter to swim. And, so, and I'm going to swim, so I'm going to practice what I preach. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much for tonight's talk. That was really interesting. And thank you to everybody who's engaged with the Q&A session as well. Um, so we have recorded the session and that will be available in the next couple of days and you'll get an email telling you when that's available. But thank you again, Jerry, and thank you for everybody who's turned up tonight and uh, hopefully see you again soon. Bye. Bye.